SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Amy von Heike, and she will speak on the topic Petition, Protests, and the Threat of the Shredder Curriculum Debate in Alberta. Join me in welcoming Dr. Van Heike. So much for the invitation um, to talk today. Um, my talk comes out of, uh, well, many years of studying the history of school curriculum um, within the context of educational policy and classroom practice. It comes out of my own experience in the most recent process of curriculum development and what might be called the UCP version of the curriculum. And mostly it comes out of my desire to bring a sense of historical perspective to the situation that we're in now. And where we seem to be is in fact a time of um, incredible partisan sniping about what our children should or should not learn. So I want to spend my time with you today exploring how we got here, considering where we are now, and perhaps suggesting how we might go forward to ensure that Alberta students get the high quality curriculum they deserve. So first, it needs to be said that public controversy and polarizing debates about curriculum are not unique to Alberta, and they're not unprecedented here. For about the past 20 years or so, we've seen history wars, math wars, textbook wars, which are really history wars by another name. We've seen authoritarian governments rewrite uh, textbooks and curriculum to indoctrinate students into particular understandings of the regime and the world. And we've seen more progressive curriculum reforms in the United States and Canada that include accounts of historical injustices and their legacies dismissed as social engineering. And in the case of Florida, even banned from the classroom. So perhaps now more than ever, school curriculum is the site, the battleground in ideologically driven culture wars. But we also have a long history in Canada of public concern and debate about what's happening in our schools. In 1953, University of Saskatchewan history professor Hilda Neatby published So Little for the Mind, a scathing critique of the progressive fads she argued had taken hold in Canadian schools, resulting in falling academic standards and moral confusion. The 1960s saw the introduction and relative failure of the new math, an approach to instruction that tried to deepen uh, students' conceptual understanding of math and hone their problem-solving skills. By the late 1960s and early 70s, the Hall-Dennis Report in Ontario and the Worth Report in Alberta made the case for the transformation of schooling to meet the demands of the technotonic age. Schools needed to step up and curriculum address pressing global problems. Students should have personalized learning to pursue their passions and become self-actualized citizens. Parents were left wondering why there were no walls in their uh, class children's schools. By the late 1970s, there was, a kind of, again, a reversion to a back to the basics and a concern about the quality of education that students were receiving, expressed here in the Harder uh, Report in Alberta that led to the development of educational quality indicators and accountability framework for Alberta schools and the reintroduction of achievement and diploma exams. In 1998, Jack Granitstein published his book, Who Killed Canadian History? And in it, he laid blame for a lack of Canadian unity and identity squarely on, of course, education professors, more concerned about political correctness than about um, ensuring Canadian students had a shared understanding and appreciation of our country's history. And of course, I'm sure that many of you remember arguments about whole language instruction and phonics. So I mean, we have an endure, this is an enduring characteristic of Alberta schools. So, why are debates about school curriculum so contentious? Well, it's the course of studies, but in that sense, it is in fact the state's answer to the question, what must children learn so that they can function appropriately as adults in our society? 
So it's what we teach in schools, but it means it's who we are, and it's who we wish to be. It gets to the core of our identity as a community. So creating a curriculum that answers this question is a value-laden endeavor, and it's also a political endeavor. And yet we often hear that we should not have, we should keep politics out of education. But politics is the way we wrestle together to think about what is the common good and create public policies that move us toward that common good. School curriculum is crucial public policy. Under the Education Act, the minister has the authority to prescribe the course of studies, but it has to be in the public interest and for the common good. And it goes awry when it goes ideological, when it goes partisan, when it's directed by political advisors rather than the community of educators and experts. And that's what we've seen over the past decade or so. Since the mid-1980s, Alberta Education said that the development of the course of studies must take into account the following principles, all of which I suppose seem relatively straightforward, but in fact they're not. What, what are the needs of learners? By what values do we determine those needs? What is important knowledge? Do we include vocational training in curriculum and not just academic subjects? What role should knowledge or physical, social, and emotional learning play in schools? So we can't disregard the fundamental philosophical grounding and the values that inform our answers to these questions. As curriculum scholar Henry Giroux reminds us, rather than being objective institutions removed from the dynamics of politics and power, schools actually are contested spheres that embody and express a struggle over what forms of authority, types of knowledge, forms of moral regulation, and versions of the past and future should be legitimated and transmitted to students. So this is a, these are complex questions, and the process of curriculum design or revision had typically been approached as an exercise in collaborative problem solving. And in contrast even to other provincial jurisdictions in Canada, in Alberta it's been a relatively open process in the sense that educators know who serves on curriculum development committees, they see drafts of programs as they're developed, and they provide feedback along the way. Since the 80s, we've typically focused on a specific subject area at a time, when it's clear that that current program is problematic or needs to be updated. And staff in the Ministry of Education consult widely with stakeholders as programs were revised. Typically, curriculum reform or uh, curriculum development committees consisted of people with different kinds of expertise. So subject area expertise, someone who is an expert in mathematics, for example, then people who have expertise in students learning in the subject. Then, of course, those with expertise in learning theory, in differentiation of learning for children with learning challenges, experts in assessment, and experts in teaching and in classroom contexts. These are obviously teachers, but I want to pause for a moment to clarify that the range of contexts um, that have to be considered when we write school curriculum in Alberta. Our program of studies is taught to, at this point, 735,000 K-12 children in Alberta schools. They attend public schools, Roman Catholic separate schools, Francophone schools, accredited private schools, charter schools, though they can make a few adaptations based on their charters. Most reserve schools in Alberta teach the provincial curriculum. So that's an array of contexts which need to be considered when we are writing programs for our students. In the 1990s, uh, the curriculum development became even more collaborative in the sense that work began on pan-Canadian frameworks uh, overseen by the Council of Ministers of Education in Canada. So our current science program of studies, which dates from 1998 actually, was informed by a pan-Canadian framework for learning and science. The Western and Northern Protocol was an agreement between the four Western provinces and the three Northern Territories to provide common framework for learning in language arts and mathematics. So once a development, or once a new program was developed or revised, it would be accompanied by a process of validation and field testing. So selected teachers, classrooms, taking up the revision, testing it, providing feedback. And at this stage, the ministry would typically begin work with publishers on authorized resources to support the program. 
and at the final stage, implementation would be supported by professional learning developed by the ministry, by the teachers association, by school boards, and by faculties of education. So it's always a challenging process, and let me be clear that none of our programs of study are or have been perfect. We would like to think that there are always excellent evidence-based reasons for, like, for selecting some content and not another, but I've seen the process play out in social studies curriculum development long enough and know that sometimes decisions about content are the result of mm, political lobbying, shall we say, um, but I've never seen partisan documents, I do have to say that. In fact, international researchers have for decades recognized the quality of Alberta's programs of study. Now for them, high quality means that they are, that they're coherent, they're well aligned. There's alignment between the content of the course of studies, the teaching resources, and the assessments. And it means that teachers are supported and empowered to meet the requirements of the curriculum within their specific teaching contexts. So our school system has been recognized globally for embodying these principles, and it's largely been because our process of curriculum de development has been very collaborative and very open. But over the past decade or so, we've been on a very strange journey in terms of our course of studies. In essence, what we're experiencing now is the culmination of over a decade of curriculum development as political performance. How did that happen? Well, in the 1990s, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development released a series of studies outlining the impact of new digital technologies on the global economy. And it argued that education systems around the world would need to change in order to prepare students for a transition from work for, in an information economy to the requirements of a knowledge economy. And with this would require a shift towards the development of competencies like creativity, problem solving, and collaboration. These discussions and initiatives were very much influenced by tech companies. For example, in Australia, the assessment and teaching of 21st century uh, skills project was funded by Cisco, Intel, and Microsoft. And Google is a, the major player in, uh, in curriculum transformation really globally. Oops. In Alberta, I mean, or in Canada, uh, we were certainly informed by uh, and influenced by these global trends, but that we were also informed by statements, concerns, by uh, organizations like the, Con the Conference Board of Canada, uh, which said that many graduating students don't have the technical critical thinking and relations skills they needed. So we need to focus on employability skills. So we've been hearing for, well, at least 20 years now, that schooling for a new millennium would need to produce flexible, creative thinkers, ready to innovate and collaborate in order to take up jobs we haven't even thought of, create technologies not yet invented, and solve problems we haven't yet identified. And yet here we are in 2022, and what we really need are semi-truck drivers and school bus drivers. <laughs> um, in Alberta, the process of curriculum reform was initiated in 2009 uh, with the then progressive conservative government's inspiring education initiative under Premier Ed Stelmack. And this initiative involved consultations um, with a wide, a huge range of education stakeholders framed around the question, what will it mean to be an educated Albertan in 2030? Turns out we don't have to wait very long to find out. Um, but at that point, it was uh, intended to facilitate the development of a high level, long-term vision for Alberta education. The vision articulated in the steering committee's report was framed around what were then identified as the three E's, that the educated Albertan in 2030 would be an engaged thinker and ethical citizen with entrepreneurial spirit, very much informed by concerns about technology and global competitiveness. It articulated a shift in curriculum that would focus less on information to be learned and more on building a set of competencies that children would need in their future work. And it was described as a transformational vision, one that would require new policy frameworks, governments, governance structures, assessment procedures, and of course redesigned programs of study in all subject areas and potentially new ones. So in 2013, a ministerial order was uh, signed, which indicated that the three E's were supposed to focus or describe the graduate. 
Uh, and then curriculum prototyping began. And I think it's fair to say that the difficulties of trying to operationalize this transformational vision became evident quite quickly. Alberta Education partnered with school divisions in order to try and um, develop new programs of study, but it sort of languished uh, in the latter days of the Prentice um, administration. And then, of course, the NDP government was elected in 2015, and it signed a memorandum of agreement with the Alberta Teachers Association, establishing an official partnership for curriculum development, also an unprecedented sort of move. $64 million was committed to that work, Curriculum working groups were created, consisting of over 400 educators and education researchers, and they took on an enormously ambitious agenda, working simultaneously in English and French to create a common architecture and framework for what was now called a concept-based curriculum. So rather than having separate programs of study for the various subject areas, the vision was a common framework and a common way of expressing outcomes in all of the subject areas. The draft program uh, was released in 2018 with invitations for feedback from uh, focus groups, parent groups, other stakeholders. And then there was an election. The UCP and their political advisors obviously thought that targeting what they called the NDP's curriculum would be a winning strategy for them. They characterized the draft as ideologically driven social engineering, said it was created in secret, they promised to end the focus on discovery or inquiry learning. Anyone who'd been paying any kind of attention to curriculum development over the past decade would have known it was hardly a secret. And the attack on the curriculum was really an attack on who they saw as the educational establishment. The Teachers Association that had worked closely with the NDP government <coughs> and on education faculties and our so-called progressive fads. As an historian of education, I know that this is not a new strategy. It is a classic straw man fa fallacy, misrepresenting what the curriculum draft actually was and what current theory and instructional practices are. But in a way, the response, the politicization of it and the, and the, and the partisan response um, was a result of the curriculum changes being described as a transformational shift so not for the first time, a clash of curriculum visions is really more rhetorical than real, but its response, it's what a response to what the draft was sold as, rather than what it actually was. Now what was lost in the partisan attacks that followed is that there were some problems with the 2018 draft. Uh, there were practical problems, there were elements of it that were misconceived, um, so when the UCP government was elected, it meant a pause on development and implementation. I was invited to participate in the Minister of Education's Curriculum Advisory Panel. I agreed. After all, it's not often that we're actually invited to provide advice on something we know about. Um, but I was also aware of the time and resources that had been invested in the process, and I hoped that, we'd been able, that we would be able to put aside the partisan attacks, address legitimate concerns with the draft program, and move forward. Well, uh, the panel provided advice to the Minister, she released a new ministerial order in summer 2020. And then in contrast to the processes by which programs have studied have been developed, uh, the government went forward with revisions that were led by individual consultants rather than teams with the expertise that I described earlier. So what did we end up with? A draft K-6 program of studies, which they argued gives students a base of essential knowledge for future learning. And in fact, like the 2018 draft, which it sort of resembles actually in some senses, it uses a common architecture or common framework to express learning in all of these subject areas. 58 out of 61 school boards across the province refused to pilot the draft when it was released. The feedback from education researchers and educators was fulsome and overwhelmingly <laughs> negative. A variety of stakeholder groups, including parent groups and Indigenous Francophone organizations expressed serious concerns. And despite the small number of classrooms piloting parts of the draft, the Minister went ahead with full implementation this past fall for K-3 English Language Arts and Literature, uh, Mathematics, and K-6 Physical Education and Wellness. Subjects that are now being revised and piloted include Francophone and French Immersion, Language Arts, Fine Art, and Science. 
social studies, which unsurprisingly became the focus of much of the negative attention, justifiably so, uh, is being held back and redeveloped. So we have yet to see what that might actually consist of. <laughs> To help you think about the challenges that have been facing our teachers this fall, um, I just want to mention three important considerations. Um, instructional time, resources, and even the context in which this has been happening. It's important to understand that Alberta education's own directions um, indicate how much time is given to specific subjects in our classrooms. So right now, grade one and two teachers, for example, are being asked to implement a new program for subjects that get about 60% of, or more, actually, of their instructional time. Um, and they've never been asked to do that before. That's an extraordinary undertaking, actually. And the other important consideration is resourcing. As I mentioned, one of the reasons Alberta's system has always been assessed as being very high quality is because we develop our own resources. <laughs> uh, and we develop them in alignment with our programs of study. Um, that hasn't happened here. I mean, clearly that's a process that takes time and it takes feedback. So this time, uh, what has happened for the most part is that Alberta Ed seems to be identifying existing resources, um, like Jump Math, for example, um, rather than investing in resource development itself. And then thinking about the context of schools right now, I mean, if you are aware, maybe your children and grandchildren have been, or your grandchildren have been out of school, um, this has been a challenging time for classrooms coming back, still um, dealing with the lingering effects of the pandemic, and now with young children ill. Um, and so teachers coping in this context and being asked to implement a new program is, is really um, challenging for them. I want to say something about strengths of the program because it's not something we typically hear and I do want to acknowledge that there are two elements of the program that have received some positive feedback and one is a clear articulation of skills related to early literacy. Uh, so explicit attention to the teaching of phonics and phonemic awareness and so on and to reading fluency. So that hasn't been, that hadn't been as, spe as specified in our earlier programs but given the need in classrooms this has been an important um, improvement in our program and it has to be said is the result of an Alberta based researchers contributions to the program hmm. uh, in math in physical education and wellness there's specific attention to financial literacy which has um, which was a real concern particularly for parents that was something that was seen as really important in the program but there are continuing concerns the government has said that this is a knowledge rich curriculum and there is research to support what can be called a knowledge-led or knowledge-rich program. But what does it mean for students to know something? Well, they have to go beyond repeating, recalling, or retrieving information. They have to have a deep understanding of what they're learning. Not just know subject matter, but know how knowledge is built in the subject. So think about it, they have to learn science, they have to learn about science, but they also have to learn how to do science. <laughs> And all of those things take time. And the program that we're still seeing is potentially problematic. It is simply filled with information to be learned. So if we continue on this path as the curriculum rolls out in the next grades, there might be a relevant historical precedent as to what might happen. In 1971, a new social studies curriculum was introduced in Alberta that was centered around uh, a process called values clarification rather than history and geography um, that had formed the content of the previous program. And it was incredibly unpopular. Uh, it, the program was widely criticized in the press, was unpopular with parents and many teachers who were very <coughs> blunt in their frustrations about the lack of suitable resources. So for the first time, the department actually hired outside uh, consultants, researchers, to examine how and why teachers were implementing or not implementing the program. And what they discovered is that teachers simply refused to teach the program as it was articulated in the documents. Um, and what was really surprising is that the researchers also clearly acknowledged that teachers weren't convinced that it was actually workable or good for students. So in fact, Alberta Education had to draw the program back, redo, re revise, and, and a new program appeared in 1981. So might there be something that our current government might learn from that? Well, they might want to back up the truck. 
<laughs> in the rush towards a so-called transformative vision for, it, for our programs, it's important to note that there was never any, really any credible evidence presented for the need for this transformation, for an expensive reform of all of our subject areas. I mean, we know that some elements of our program are outdated or are problematic, but it's a renovation we need, not a revolution. <coughs> and in order to get back on track, we also need to get back to the collaborative process that curriculum development has been. Some months ago, I might have agreed with some academic colleagues who argued that really the responsibility for curriculum development should be taken out of the hands of the minister and handed over to an autonomous curriculum council. But given the way we seem to be um, mistrusting the advice of experts these days, I'm not sure that the public would swallow what experts had to say. But we also can't develop curriculum through crowdsourcing. It can't be imposed from above, and it can't be de developed on Twitter. What we need is the expertise around the table of all of, of all of our educators and the context. And what we've seen to this point are consistent efforts to circumvent professional educators. So let's recognize, draw on, and value the expertise of educators and our Alberta researchers in order to develop the curriculum that Alberta students really deserve. much and now we will have our question and answer period and we will ask people to line up along this this wall right here and uh, please have your question ready no long explanatory historical backgrounds she says <laughs> sort of ironic and uh, over to Amy thank you Hi, Amy. Hi. And in Mundle. Yes. Um, just now you ended up with the image of the backing up the truck. So my question to you is, what do you think is more likely that the current UCP government will back up that truck or that they will be tossed out? <laughs> well, I don't know that I can answer that one. And as, as someone in the education, I mean, I'm not a political scientist or take the pulse. Um, and I, and it's also important to remember, as I as I mentioned, that I, you know, we wouldn't want a, a kind of ideologically driven curriculum, regardless of the government that's in power. Right? It's not about choosing the government's agenda that we want our students to learn. It's about creating a curriculum that is worthy of their time and, and, and what we want in terms of the citizens uh, of our community. So in, actually, it shouldn't matter who, who we elect. What should matter is that it, it's, it's a proven, defensible process. And that, is, as, I, as I say, is open, not in the sense that, as I say, it's crowdsourced or developed on Twitter, but that, it is, that people understand um, and, and, can, and can provide feedback. Hello, thank you very much for a very succinct and, and uh, uh, informative uh, presentation. That was very helpful for me. I'm not an educator, I'm a social worker, retired. Uh, but, Your name? Oh, my name, and yes, thank you. Yeah, I thought of it first, but then I forgot it. <laughs> this is the leaky brain situation. Um, Mary Shillington. Um, we have uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren in the school division now. and. Um, uh, I remember when our, our choir leader, uh, Ken Rogers, who was very uh, involved in music, was asked to be part of a committee to develop a new pro music program. And he was really, really excited about it and worked hard on it. Uh, and then, plunk, he was off uh, because it changed. And, and, and so, like, how do we make sure that people who have expertise and passion, because that's what he had, yep. passion for a program that's going to be helpful for kids. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that happens in the future? Yeah, as I say, I think it, it, it's really about returning to the process that we have used for decades. And I mean, again, one of the, <laughs> Um, I mean, the NDP's process of bringing 400 educators together was, I think, very empowering for a lot of teachers who hadn't necessarily been 
around the table as consistently as they might have been. Um, but I will say, I mean, there, it's not surprising that the people who were doing fine arts were very um, enthusiastic about the program. Going back to that draft K-4 program that they developed, there were literally 160 pages of fine arts outcomes for K-4 teachers in fine art and 13 pages in social studies. Um, so that was one example of some challenges and, and things that we knew needed to be rethought. Um, but I, I, to your point of having teachers who are nominated by their school divisions, which is what happened there, invited to participate, and, um, and, and really feeling that their, their voices and experiences matter, I think is, is really crucial, yeah. Fiona Jacobs, thanks for your talk, it was very interesting. Thank you for the mic. Um, um, so, having worked at the university, um, <laughs> We know that there's kind of the idea of um, turning out widgets. Uh, and back in the 90s, we had the idea of saying, we are not a sausage factory, we're an education facility. So, and I kind of picked up that that's kind of an undercurrent here, that we don't see these kids as future citizens, we see them as, a, as labor resources. Um, and there's a difference there. So, to what extent do you think that the experience of the pandemic and what we, how we survived it in terms of, um, I'm, I'm thinking now about the, the musical aspect, the arts and, yes, and all that other yeah. stuff coming forward to carry us through and the whole mental health issues. Yes. How do you think that's going to influence the whole issue going forward? Mm -hmm. well, it's a great question because um, Public education systems were established in the 19th century to, you know, make pe people work productively and be productive citizens and understand uh, how to how to participate in their society. So there's nothing new here, I think, in in what is sometimes a tension, shall we say, between attending and addressing students' sort of vocational needs, but also their needs as, as growing human beings and, and what they have to contribute to a society that we might actually all want to live in. Um, and I, I take your point. I mean, I think all of us learned through the pandemic that, in fact, it's the arts um, that, that helped so many of us through that experience. So then to see that undermined uh, within the context of school curriculum or even at the post-secondary level is so um, problematic. And I see, I mean, I have a long history of music education myself and performance, um, so I, I really, you know, I've always really felt for my musical educator colleagues who end up having to make sort of vocational arguments in order to defend music education. So rather than it makes us, you know, well-rounded um, and compassionate human beings, uh, they always have to come up with a sort of vocational defense uh, for the teaching of the arts. Um, so I wish I was optimistic and could say, oh, there'll be far more support for the arts. We're not seeing that. And in fact, what I'm hearing from music educators in the field um, is a real concern about um, that there are fewer and fewer music educators and music, a sort of fulsome music education programs in schools. Um, that even the arts education is very much more framed towards, you know, visual design or things that are seen as occupationally um, focused rather than artistically focused. I think that's very sad. Um, my name is Terry Shellington. Um, uh, you referred to the culture wars that kind of mess up our curriculum development. Uh, I wonder if you could explain to me why the history of the residential school system became such a fighting point. Uh, and it would seem to be a piece of history that would logically belong in talking about history at a children's level. Uh, yet I remember it was so contentious and I just failed to understand why why that isn't, why, why sensible people can't agree on something like that, but you maybe it brings some extra common sense. Well, I wish common sense was a bit more common. I suppose that's the first. Um, and, it, and it's interesting because um, Alberta 
schools, Alberta curriculum, was sort of a national leader in teaching about residential schooling, actually. Um, that was a, a kind of uh, innovation of our 2005 social studies program, which was really the first to articulate and require um, kind of sustained attention to Indigenous perspectives um, and worldviews on contemporary social issues as well, and political issues as well as historical um, uh, experiences. So um, when, and as someone who was involved with that curriculum, I actually, it, it wasn't contentious at that point. Uh, and like I say, this has been a focus of instruction in grade 10 social studies uh, since 2005. So I think it was less about um, it sort of just being in the curriculum and children learning about it than about more general pushback towards the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, for example. Um, and I have to tell so I teach a course in the history of education at the University of Lethbridge to student teachers. And one of uh, the themes that we explore is what um, children were taught about Indigenous people sort of from begin from 1905 to the present day. And um, they are often quite shocked, not, I mean, by the material even from the 50s and 60s and 70s, when children were putting on Indian headdresses or making things, you know, crafts, um, and doing projects. And I'm not sure I should say this because I'm being recorded, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but when we do this sort of extensive analysis of what children in public schools were taught about Indigenous people, the, the best comment I've ever had was a spontaneous exclamation from a student who said, oh, that's why my grandfather is such a... For them, it was a very powerful moment to realize that their grandparents had been miseducated. And they take very seriously their responsibility to re-educate. <laughs> and I'm so proud that they are often willing to have very challenging conversations with people they love, <laughs> uh, but with who, people that, with whom they really disagree when it comes to, for example, teaching about residential schools or the experience of Indigenous people. So um, I always end that section, that portion of the course, um, with the comment from Murray St. Clair. It's actually a quote um, from the commission report where he says, as this generation, as that young generation, comes through their schooling with a new understanding and into universities and through teacher education programs, we'll begin to see the change that, that we need. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Benaghi. Very good to see you again. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, how far, uh, sorry, Mark Slingerland. Thank you. Uh, how far are we backing up the truck? Um, so, you know, you described the, the history that this is something from the PCs and the NDP yeah. and the UCP have all had aspects of this. Uh, I, I have some concern that now the, the current instantiation of that is the UCP curriculum, which has to be tossed, right. and yeah. we're back in the, in the same cycle, right? Yeah. Where the, the early literacy and, and a few other things that, that are, are strong points mm -hmm. and the, the common framework mm -hmm. is part of that transformational approach. Mm -hmm. um, there are some good things in there. How, how do you see us moving forward yeah. rather than just backing up the truck and maybe running over a few <laughs> worthwhile passengers on the way? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, and I, I take your point, and as I say, knowing the time and resources that have gone into program development for you know well over a decade now, uh, there have been lessons learned, I think, about positive elements of the programs, and in fact, um, even the structure of the, uh, and framework of this program isn't that dissimilar, actually, from the earlier um, version. There are some strange round holes they're trying to put into square pegs, but um, so I don't know. I, I take your point. I don't know. I, it, I'm not. We don't need another shredder. Um, but what we do need is an authentic and um, meaningful ability for teachers to give feedback. 
Um, even after the few classrooms in which it was piloted, there were, we were told that there were changes made because of feedback from educators, but it wasn't at all clear what those changes were, right? Um, so I think it's not necessarily about discarding everything that they are trying. I would s strongly recommend a pause um, and don't continue into the seven to 12 grade levels at this point. But I think um, if, they, if, if there was a serious conversation in which teachers felt that their feedback was going to be respected and was going to be attended to and their concerns addressed, we might well be able to, to again modify rather than throw it through the shredder. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy, for a really informative and in-depth um, presentation. Um, my question relates to Laurie Schultz, by the way, thanks. Um, the University of Lethbridge, as I understand it, has one of the best education faculties in the training of teachers. I think it's grown stronger over the years. Um, so now, in 2022, you know, for any student who wants to become a teacher, starting, you know, going back to the university in 2023, can you comment on, um, you know, does the University of Lethbridge have a good education program, or has that also been shredded a little bit too? Yeah, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I mean, I, we continue to take pride and, and really work hard with our student teachers and, and the feedback that we get from the field um, is that they're, they're well prepared and, and they're, they're able to, to engage um, constructively and I would say critically with whatever program of study. Um, I mean we make it very clear that teachers are not transmitters of curriculum, you know, they're not there to know, as technicians to install curriculum the way a plumber might install something in your sink. Um, they, they need to make curriculum come to life with their students in their classrooms and, and we continue to do that work with whatever formal curriculum <laughs> happens to be in place and we help them to become I think critical thinkers around educational issues as well. Um, and you know uh, we um, Unlike other university faculties, we actually do have a memorandum of agreement with the Minister of Education that says that our program uh, helps graduates or ensures that graduates meet what is called the teaching quality standard. So there are six specific competencies that they need to demonstrate in terms of professional knowledge and building the inclusive classrooms and so on. So those are the focus of what we uh, of, our, of our work, of our coursework with teachers, of their practicum experiences. We're very tied to the field. Um, I'm supervising interns right now who have been in since September doing practica, and, and in fact, I'm going from here to do a final meeting <laughs> uh, at a local school. So I think the fact that we, we know our school context well, um, it serves our students well. And ultimately, as we often have to remind our colleagues in arts and science, <laughs> We don't just teach our students, we teach the students they're teaching, um, which gives us, I think, a slightly different way of understanding um, our work and our moral commitment to the work we do. Hi, thanks, Amy. Uh, I have uh, a short question outlined, Tony Pargeter, and uh, I was at some point in the last millennium a teacher. <laughs> Um, I have a short question and, and a broader one. The short one is, is are they currently in force curricula posted on some website that we could actually mm -hmm. read them? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you could tell yeah. us where to find them. But the broader question is, and relates to the last one, and that is about the connection between the formal curricula and what actually happens in the classroom. Um, we have a neighbor who teaches science at the Lethbridge Christian School. Whatever the curriculum says, I can't imagine that he is teaching um, some allegedly contentious subject like evolution, climate change, residential schools, in the same way that I, as a reality-based person, would teach them. And I have no idea how these things are taught in the Catholic school system. So my question is, in, in a sense, you know, how much does it matter what the curriculum says, and, and uh, you know. 
how well is it connected with actual teaching practice? Well, that first question is a lot easier. Uh, so if you go to Alberta Education's website, you, there are direct links to programs of study, and they have versions for professional educators. There are also versions for parents or guardians that they can access sort of in more succinct versions, I suppose. But uh, if you choose to dive into the program, just the, the draft, K-6, to um, was 480 pages long if you printed it out. Uh, so there's a lot to look at if you choose to go down that rabbit hole. I would also encourage you to Google Alberta Curriculum Analysis website um, because one of the really interesting things that happened when the draft came out um, is that uh, the deans of education in Alberta worked together to establish a website that would become a repository for scholars' engagement with it, their reviews for the reviews of school divisions, for example. So it includes sort of scholarly responses responses from school boards, as well as media stories uh, about it. It's a kind of centralized repository for all of that commentary. So that's also can be, uh, that's an informative uh, source for you. On the other question in terms of how the curriculum was out in different contexts in Alberta, Again, um, I mean, a few, actually just before the pandemic, I was asked by Johns Hopkins at, in, 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 the, at, uh, in the United States, uh, essentially, uh, to try and explain why Alberta's school system is so good. <laughs> As they said, Alberta has the most diverse school contexts, publicly funded, uh, really of any jurisdiction in North America. How do you do that and how do you, how do you provide public funding for such an array and still ensure that there is a high, high quality experience for students regardless of whether they're attending um, charter schools, a Roman Catholic separate school, a public school, a specialized program like a Christian school. So um, it's a long report that explains how curriculum and assessment and teacher preparation uh, are all woven together and the kind of accountability framework that Alberta schools operate under. So you're quite right, our curriculum plays out in very specific and unique ways that honor the context in which curriculum plays out. Uh, I was just, I had a great conversation recently with one of my graduate students who was teaching Shakespeare on reserve. And you can imagine that her teaching of Shakespeare, in this case it was Julius Caesar, uh, looks very different in that reserve school than a school in West Lethbridge or South Edmonton or whatever. And that's as it should be. <laughs> Teachers should be using their professional judgment to, to live a program with their students. Um, that said, there are required outcomes of programs, regardless of context, that must be met. And it is the job of our principals to be evaluating teachers, to be um, sort of approving or, or reviewing their long-term plans. Um, you know, we expect professional reflection and growth from teachers. Um, so I, I don't think it's fair to say that there are contexts in which students are, you know, are not meeting the outcomes of the program. I mean, there are there are the there are, there, are, there are safeguards in place to ensure that curriculum is always interpreted in a way that is really that meets the needs of students and is authentic to the intention of the program. Hi, my name is Tom Moffat, and uh, thanks for your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, just a question on um, something that yeah, you might be able to bring some perspective to, given your uh, expertise. And that I was wondering if you might be able to comment on uh, how the current government's ban on remote learning might affect student outcomes. turned on, turn, had, had to, to, to pivot to online instruction, um, saw the challenges as well as opportunities and I've long taught online, for example, in our graduate program, uh, in, in our Masters of Education program, so I, I was certainly, I mean, I, I understand the affordances and limitations, shall we say, of, of online instruction, uh, but when school divisions had to pivot and go online, um, 
my goodness, that certainly laid bare some of the equity issues in our schools. I mean, families that did not have access to the technology they required and so on. Um, and there's no question that that kind of learning um, certainly met the needs of some students and not others. Um, my concern about the government prescribing anything and then sort of as a blanket um, is that it, it really does tie the hands of schools, administrators who might be in a unique situation where they have to do um, a kind of short-term pivot, for example, to online instruction. Um, I was speaking with a, a local principal who told me uh, that some weeks ago they actually, um, they had over a third of their student population out uh, with illness. And in any other in another context or with with a different set of, of regulations, they they might well have mandated masking in the school. Uh, they might well have pivoted to online instruction briefly as a way to sort of control that outbreak. And instead, they found themselves um, with both staff members and and the significant portion of their student body out. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. Um, and as someone who has had to cope with odd, I, I, mean, <laughs> I like teaching face-to-face, -face and teaching online's okay, but to do both simultaneously is the worst of all possible worlds. <laughs> so the problem with saying you can't go online is that in fact you end up forcing teachers to do a sort of weird blended thing where there are students in a computer that you're trying to teach while you have students in front of you in a classroom. Um, and that is um, really not uh, a good situation for anyone. So I guess my long answer to that question is that I think that was a, a very unfortunate and short-sighted and ideologically driven um, mandate to schools rather than something that's in the best interest of teachers and students. Uh, I can see your um I was actually very glad to hear Tony's question and your response to that because the initial part of your, your presentation, which was very good, was that what was driving changes to the curriculum was producing willing workers. Mm -hmm. And that goes back my entire lifetime and probably much more. So we can, we can just understand that is one of the pressures. But the question I have is more political and more pragmatic. Over the, over the last 30 years, what we've seen is a hiving off of various sectarian communities. Um, not, I mean, we've, we've always had the Roman Catholics, that's, that's constitutionally mandated, and they've become more or less, there's not that hell of a lot of difference between that and the secular school system. But the other school systems, and there are a number of them, and a lot of them are now being hidden under the mantle of the Palace of School Division who is co covering for, for independent schools all over the province. What I mean, is your question? <laughs> okay, the question is, you have to have some context here. Now, the question is, are we also seeing pressures put on the secular school system, in quotes, by the hiving off of those sectarian schools? Victory Christian, Monarch, whatever. So as I say, Alberta offers uh, public funding for the greatest array of contexts, of school contexts. And uh, for a lot of reasons, including legal reasons actually, um, we provide public funding for religious schools that are alternative programs in the public system. So they go through a process of vetting and school boards uh, really are left with the policy decision as to whether or not they wish uh, to take formerly independent Christian schools into their system or otherwise. And so, for example, the City of uh, Calgary Public Board has consistently refused um, to take in religious alternative programs, which is why we have this anomalous situation of religious schools in Calgary, Muslim as well as Christian, actually being part of Palliser School Division. Um, so I realize that there are probably you know, mixed feelings or beliefs about the appropriateness of this, um, but we, again, we live in an interesting context in Alberta where, as you can imagine, it's hard to tell a religious community that they do not have um, access to religiously informed schooling when Roman Catholics have full public funding for their schools. So there is a political context, I think that's important, a historical legal context. 
Um, and as I often say to my students, uh, you know, we can certainly debate the merits of um, education that is delivered in a faith context that is faith informed for sure, but would you rather have them in the system, accountable, or would you rather have them out of the system and unaccountable, which is what happens in other jurisdictions. So in Ontario, yeah, those schools exist. They get no public funding. They are also not at all accountable for what they do. Um, so here in Alberta, if it's uh, um, the Muslim schools in Calgary or Christian schools in Lethbridge Public, they are certificated teachers. The, the students learn the curriculum, they write the achievement and diploma exams, they're overseen by a public school board uh, rather than um, you know, a private board, for example. Um, but there are, there are strings attached to that money, I guess is my point. And for all of the, like the array of historical, legal, and other reasons why we have this system, in my view, I would rather have them in with strings than out and without. <laughs> this will be the last question. Uh, thank you for a great presentation, Maria Fitzpatrick. Uh, I have a granddaughter uh, and a great-granddaughter in uh, public education in Alberta. And you had talked about, uh, you think that the grade seven uh, forward curriculum should be on a pause. Mm -hmm. My granddaughter is about to go into grade seven next year and I'm pretty concerned about it. Uh, critical thinking yep. is, is something that uh, I value. Uh, having grown up in a Catholic school system in Newfoundland, mm -hmm. my uh, question, question of why was what uh, saved me. So what do you, uh, what do you think if if this curriculum moves forward, what are we going to do in terms of our kids and critical thinking? Well, yeah, I mean, thank goodness that the you know, critical thinking pedagogy is something all of my, our teachers, I think, would be quite attentive to and addressing regardless of the limitations uh, of, of a program, for sure. Um, and at this point, you know, I don't want to speculate as to you know, what we'll see with the program moving forward, all I can say is um, <laughs> we all know that media literacy and critical thinking are just crucial and, and our ability to have um, productive conversations across difference, right? Um, I mean, we have to, our citizenship education has to not just be about being able to talk to people in our own circles and echo chambers, uh, but has to help us make connections with people we might otherwise not wish to talk to, actually. Um, and, you know, this is <laughs> the, the beauty of our public schools and, and our school context that, uh, I mean, I, I, I go into any school in Lethbridge and I am, um, you know, moved, actually, by the diversity I see, quite different in, than what I was raised with, uh, and the the commitment of teachers to working with their students to help them become critical and compassionate citizens um, that all of us would want as, as our neighbors. So I, I absolutely take your point, and that, that is a concern with the program that's sort of so filled with information or to, to be learned that there's no attempt to, to give it sort of the critical consideration it deserves. but. Um, we all have to do everything in our power to make sure that we end up with, <laughs> and, and that our, our policymakers get the message that they need to do better for our kids. Thank you, Amy. Now we always ask our, our speakers if they have a takeaway thought for us as we leave this room. What is your takeaway suggestion for us? probably what many of you I know do anyway, um, which is to advocate <laughs> and to write letters and to be in touch with policymakers. And, um, you know, I, we often, I think, uh, even once our own kids are out of school, <laughs> 
we still have a vested interest in what's happening in those schools. Um, my husband is now retiring from the Faculty of Education. He is a critical thinking researcher and pedagogue, and even his parting comment to his students was, keep doing the good work because you're going to be making my end of life decision. <laughs> but the reality is, I mean, our, our school programs, our school curriculum is crucial public policy, and that's why I say it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not um, an insult to call it political because it, what that means is that it, we need to be involved and our voices need to be heard, and we cannot leave it uh, to the political advisors. to our guest speaker today, Dr. Amy Van Hiking. And uh, next week, we'll be back here, same time, same place, to hear Maria Moyer.